Throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, the North Polar Arctic was imagined not as an uninhabitable sheet of ice as modern-day scientists and cartographers hold, but as a series of circular islands. The number of islands vary among these maps, although striking similarities can be seen, even on maps that were made thousands of miles away from one another. Did the map makers of the time simply copy and make additions to the popular maps which were false? Or perhaps, as I'm proposing, that this series of Arctic lands is not made up, but exists on our Earth. This region was subsequently deleted from future maps, and ever since, the common narrative is that the North Pole is a lifeless, uninhabitable stretch of ice. This is a short presentation on these maps, what they tell us, and how they relate. This map from 1531, made by Oronce Fine, shows four large islands at the North Pole, with various landforms scattered around. Just to demonstrate where we are, many have never looked at older maps. This is Europe, Africa, Canada, and Russia. This is Greenland, quite close to the North Pole's southern continent. At the center we see a massive rock formation or mountain. We can draw similarities to the center of the four-continent system of Asian cosmology, where a sacred mountain known as Mount Maru or Mount Shumasin lay. This map from 1534, made by the same map maker, gives us a similar but slightly different configuration. The north polar lands are seen as five or six large islands, and the center being what appears to be a central island, again with a large rock formation. This is Greenland, Scandinavia, Iceland, and Canada. This map is from 1594 and made by Cornelius de Jose. At first glance, we notice how magnified the North Polar region is compared to the previous maps. Instead of Oronce Fine's version with large bodies of water separating the island, we have the four continent system divided by thin canals, which meet at the center, where there is again seemingly a massive rock. For reference, we have Greenland, Scandinavia, Iceland, and Canada. This map, also from 1594, by Petrus Plancius, shows these same four continents, but separated via hemisphere. The inland sea where the four rivers meet is very pronounced, and again, we can marvel at how large of a system this is, and also how close it is to what we would call these outer lands. This map from 1595 by Gerhard Mercator gives us a close-up of this system. In small letters reads, Rupes Nigra et Altissima, the black and very high rock, at the center. There is a mountain range surrounding each island continent, which in one of Mercator's letters he describes as being 14 miles wide. This is a version from 1608. It's interesting that in previous versions of this map, the southern continent isn't sort of blurred out, but is extended. The smaller islands below are completely different. It's hard to tell, but Greenland is practically touching this island with a land bridge, or it could be a thin canal, no more than 5 to 10 miles wide. This undated map of the Arctic Circle, or Circulus Arcticus, is very similar to Mercator's maps around the same time except the center land contains no magnetic rock or rivers dividing it. It's simply one continent. The word Hyperbore, which labels this continent, refers to the mythological far northern Greek paradise of Hyperborea, the land beyond the north wind. Greenland is referred to in this map as Iloxoa. To the right is Scythia, which is interesting because in the 4th century BC, Aristotle wrote of Hyperborea as being past the Riphian Mountains, on the borders of Scythia, although no topography is shown on this map. This is an undated Japanese map with no name attached. It looks like it's probably from the mid-1500s. The Arctic region on both hemispheres show it looks like the edges of the four landmasses. This map, too, is undated with no recorded name. It's a Chinese map we clearly see the northern half of the same structure shown in Mercator maps, the indrawing seas, dividing rivers, large rock at the center. Here's another undated Chinese map. This one is the sloppiest, least concise, and most different of all of these maps. 
there are five or six main islands with various scattered smaller ones. And just for reference, this is Canada, Russia, and this landmass appears to be Greenland. This map from 1567 by Abraham Ortelius includes at the North Pole two of the four island continent system. And this is like the original Mercator maps, showing Greenland with either a connecting land bridge or a thin canal between the borders. All compasses on Earth point to the Holy Grail, attracted by the magnetic Mount Maru at the center of our flat plane, the crater into which when we enter, we are brought into a mystical, hidden land, one which is not affected by the parasitism which is so common on these outer lands. These maps prove that the knowledge of Eden, of Shambhala, Agartha, was once widespread, but for some reason was deleted from public knowledge and occulted. But now is the unveiling. The gates of Eden are open. Gerardus Mercator was a 16th century Belgian cartographer and geographer who was most renowned for creating the 1569 world map based on a new projection which represented sailing courses of constant bearing as straight lines. In the bottom left corner, we see a close-up of the Arctic, showing what appears to be a large mountain with four rivers diverging. This is, in fact, a smaller representation of Mercator's Arctic map titled Of the Northern Lands. On this map, he envisions the center as a large black rock, the Rupes Negra, surrounded by a great whirlpool into which four powerful rivers flow. These rivers divide a large landmass into four distinct islands. When the English polymath John Dee wrote to Mercator asking about his sources for this map, Mercator returned with a letter stating, In the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool, into which there empty these four indrawing seas which divide the north. Right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea, and it is all of magnetic stone. A giant magnetic rock, exactly at the North Pole. Well, that would explain why all compasses point north, wouldn't it? If we are to look at the false heliocentric system with two magnetic poles, we should become very wary very quickly because all compasses point north all the time. If we supposedly live on a globe with a South Pole, why is the pole always north? When one travels further in the Southern Hemisphere, why wouldn't compasses point south? The scientific elite try to keep us in constant confusion and in opposition of diving into the matter, giving us a sort of mental duct tape by telling us there are three different poles, a magnetic, a geomagnetic, and a geographic. I can assure you that the more one looks into these poles, the more one realizes it's all bullshit. The North Pole is north, underneath the North Star Polaris, at the center of the Flat Earth Dome, shining down on Rupes Nigra, or, as I like to call it by its Vedic name, the Magnetic Mount Maru. Like many of the ancient systems, Vedic cosmology knew the Earth was flat, with a center axis, envisioned the universe as a sort of round chandelier, with the luminaries revolving above, and most importantly, with a center universal column on which we find Mount Maru. Here it is. In the center of Bhumandala is the circular island of Jambudvipa, which represents Earth, with nine Varsha subdivisions. In the center stands the cone-shaped Mount Maru, which represents the world axis and is surmounted by the city of Brahma, the universal creator. Could this center landform be the same divided island found in Mercator's map? Could Mount Maru be the Rubus Nigra? And could the city of the god Brahma be a reference to the inner earth city of Shambhala? The center vortex is conjoined to the Axis Mundi, hitting Mount Maru with its resplendent rays. At Mount Maru, we can choose to walk into a higher frequency, but that's if you make it past the Bifrost Bridge. In the Norse text Gilfaginning, the Bifrost Bridge is described as the pathway between heaven and earth, Asgard and Midgard.
the school of theosophy teaches that a series of seven root races or humanities will develop during the present round of the Earth's spiritual evolution. We are currently in the fifth. Each lives on its own continent, a word referring not only to the main continental area where the evolution of a root race takes place, but also to all the dry land that exists during the life period of a root race. Just as the root races overlap, so parts of the continents of one root race become incorporated into the continental system of the next. Creation unfolds as a series of epochs. For each epoch, there is a day and a night. During your life, you experience day and night. Similarly, from a higher point of view, your entire life is one day. Death is the entrance into night. After night passes, a new day arrives, a new existence. And the same is true of these worlds. Related to this humanity, there have been many days and nights. We are now in the middle of a great cosmic day. In Sanskrit, what's called a Mahamanvantara. We are in the fourth day, or epoch, and there are seven cycles or rounds within each day. In the Akashic records, there have only been four epochs. This current epoch has had to do with moving away from etheric existence to physical existence. Helena Blavatsky writes, We believe in the seven continents, four of which have already lived their day. The fifth still exists, and two are to appear in the future. The first continent was the imperishable sacred land. Although little can be said of it, it capped over the whole North Pole like one unbroken crust. This was the home of the first race of mankind, the polar race, which had neither type nor color. These, our first ancestors, had ethereal, not physical bodies, and could not be injured or destroyed by death. We can absolutely draw a parallel to Plato's account of an original race that was deathless and non-breeding. In the Kabbalah of the Mayan Mysteries, Samael on Weor writes, The Aztecs state that the human beings of the first root race were extraordinary dark-colored giants. This was a very civilized, androgynous, asexual, semi-physical, semi-ethereal root race. The first root race lived on the sacred island situated in the North Polar Cap. That island still exists, yet it is in a jinn state within the fourth dimension. The second continent is very elusive. It's considered home of the second root race, the Greek Hyperborean race. Theosophical accounts say it extended southward and westward from the North Pole, but most others have identified the North Pole as Hyperborea's location, including René Guénon, Miguel Serrano, William Warren, and many others. Not to mention, the name itself, Hyperborea, refers to something beyond the Aurora Borealis, which shoots out of the center of our plane. So despite what Theosophy says, everything points to Hyperborea as being a polar continent. It's strange because in this way, it's very much related to the imperishable sacred land. And one must ask, is the second continent simply the first continent in a later time period? It's more than likely. After all, continents, as Blavatsky writes, has to do with all of the land in general inhabited during a root races cycle. Let's go over to what Miguel Serrano has said in Nod's Book of the Resurrection. He writes, Hyperborea still exists, beyond the yellow sun and the black sun, in the ray of green light, suggesting that Hyperborea, once a continent existing at the North Pole, now has an etheric double within the realms of the green light, the Aurora Borealis. But this is pretty much what Samael Anwior wrote of the first continent. We'll resolve this later. The third continent is said to have stretched from the Indian Ocean to Australia, and this is known as Lemuria or Mu. This was when the gods walked the earth and mixed freely with mortals. All of these stories of Nephilim and Anaki, these originate in Lemuria, and this is also when the fall of man began. It was a slow process that kept up during the fourth continent. The survivors of the destruction of Lemuria gave birth to Atlantis. Hierarchies in society began, and worship of material goods started. The Atlanteans had degenerated a great deal and had now started using their awesome powers for evil. Their magical science became black, and with these changes came horrible devices. The Atlanteans could now create a mental monster that could crystallize into existence through their willpower. Millions of people perished, and all of the powerful cities of Atlantis submerged within the ocean that now bears its name. 
The fifth continent is said to be Asia, where theosophical writings tell us the fifth root race began. Of course, we're still in this race time period, so all dry land is the fifth continent. It's said that this Aryan root race, instead of evolving, has devolved, and its corruption is now worse than that of the Atlanteans in their epoch. And there are two more continents and races that have yet to exist within this great cosmic day. The account preserved in the book of Genesis can be interpreted to agree with Blavatsky's first four races. Genesis actually points to four different creation stories within one creation story. The first, the creation by the Elohim of a male and female spiritual Adam. The second creation story tells of a more materialized being made of the dust of the earth and placed in Eden, which in theosophy is recognized as the polar homeland. The third creation story tells of the separation into sexes, and the last, the definitive entry into physical bodies and the exclusion from Eden. In this way, this great cosmic day can not only be seen as four races and four continents, but it's describing the devolution from light bodies to dense physical bodies. René Ganon's account of Hyperborea resembles Blavatsky's in many ways. According to Ganon, this current Adamic cycle, which Ganon believed to be now nearing its close, began in the Hyperborean land called Tula, a similar name to the Greek capital city of Hyperborea called Thule. It was the first and supreme center, the archetypal sacred island, and its situation was literally polar, at the origin. What manner of beings live there, Ganon does not say, but he gives one to understand that our cycle of humanity began there, identifying, you guessed it, Mount Maru at the center of the earth, whom Blavatsky herself said of, Maru, the abode of the gods, was placed as before explained in the North Pole. Maru is the high abode of the gods. If we are to put together what so many authors and mystics have written, it's clear that the North Pole has significance as a flourishing paradise. Although right now we cannot resolve the odd tension between the polar and Hyperborean race, but we can gather enough of an idea. In Blavatsky's Cosmogony, the first root race was created from pure spirit, and again, lived at the North Pole. This sacred land is stated never to have shared the fate of the other continents, because it is the only one whose destiny is to last from the beginning to the end. While every race has and will be destroyed, this first race remains existing and flourishing today, housing the original divine consciousness. Accordingly, it is the cradle of the first man, and the dwelling of the last divine mortal. Blavatsky writes, If the teaching is understood correctly, the first continent which came into existence capped over the whole North Pole like one unbroken crust, and remains so to this day, beyond that inland sea which seemed like an unreachable mirage to the few Arctic travelers who perceived it. Terms such as the blessed land of eternal light and summer, and the land of the eternal sun, are throughout theosophy literature, and this is referring to this continent and to the central sun, which neither sets nor rises in this imperishable land. Tibetan sacred texts speak of a mystical kingdom called Shambhala, where the most sacred of the Buddhist teachings are preserved. Both the Hindu and Buddhist traditions say it contains a magnificent central palace radiating a powerful, diamond-like light. Buddhist texts say that Shambhala can only be reached by a long and difficult journey across a wilderness of deserts and mountains, and warn that only those who are called and have the necessary spiritual preparation will be able to find it. Others will only find blinding storms, empty mountains, or even death. One text says that the kingdom of Shambhala is round, but it is usually depicted as an eight-petaled lotus. I've said this before, a symbol of the heart chakra. Indeed, an old Tibetan story states that the kingdom of Shambhala is in your own heart. The guidebooks to Shambhala, whose puzzling directions are a mixture of realism and fantasy, can be read on one level as instructions for taking an inner journey from the familiar world of the surface consciousness through the wilds of the subconscious to the hidden sanctuary of the superconscious. But even so, the idea that Shambhala is also located in the material world is firmly rooted in Tibetan tradition. Shambhala, our spiritual home, 
is said in Theosophy to comprise two localities on Earth. One of them is situated in the highlands of Asia, somewhere to the westward of the meridian line passing through Lhasa. Long ago, this locality was a sacred island in a vast Central Asian inland sea, known as the Abyss of Learning, or Sea of Knowledge, and was accessible via subterranean passages. But there is also another holy location, alluded to in all the great exoteric religions. This spot is near what the Hindu Puranas call Mount Maru, what the Arabians call Mount Quaff, and what the Greeks call Mount Olympus. It is the North Pole. As one approaches the North Pole from the snowy Arctic, the air actually becomes warmer and warmer, the snow cover thinner and thinner, until there are only grassy tundras, flowers, and a subtropical climate. This is the atmosphere of the center landmass enveloping Mount Maru. The Zoroastrian Avesta refers to the mediator angel Srosha dwelling on the cosmic mountain Hare, the Persian equivalent of Mount Maru at the Bridge of Decision, leading to paradise. Similarly, the Hindu myths remind us that at the summit of Maru encircles Brahma's golden city. The Mandian Gnostics believed in an ideal version of Earth called Mishuni Akushta, an Earth of Light, peopled by a divine race of superhumans, and this was situated in the far north, separated from our world by a high mountain. Mishuni Akushta was said to exist between heaven and earth, just like Mount Maru. Shambhala which is a Sanskrit word meaning place of peace or place of silence, is a mythical paradise spoken of in ancient texts, including the Kala Chakra Tantra and the ancient scriptures of the Zhang Zun culture which predated Tibetan Buddhism. According to legend, it is a land where only the pure of heart can live, a place where love and wisdom reigns, and where people are immune to suffering, toil, and old age. The idea of Shambhala is said to have outer and inner meanings. The outer meaning understands Shambhala to exist as a physical place, although only individuals with the appropriate karma can reach it and experience it as such. Those who have risen above their own animalistic nature and gone inwards, those who have activated the green ray of their heart, may pass into the semi-physical, semi-ethereal paradise of Shambhala, which, as I've been describing, is located at the Arctic at the north pole of our flat plain. It's said that the kingdom is completely surrounded by snow mountains. These outer mountains are very similar to what Gerhard Mercator mentioned in his 1577 letter to John Dee, writing, The mountain range goes round the north like a wall, save that in 19 places the indrawing channels flow through it. We can clearly see the surrounding mountains in the 1595 Mercator map. So if one were to travel by sea, they would simply have to find one of the openings in order to make the easiest entrance in. Shambhala is lush with parks and meadows, flowers and abundant vegetation. All the inhabitants of Shambhala live in absolute peace and harmony, free from sickness or hunger. They are all of a healthy and beautiful appearance, and their language is Sanskrit. There are no such things as physical punishment or imprisonment. As there is nobody to be punished, the kings are not tyrannical, but are religious figures, and evil is foreign to the land. As pure of a place this is, the inhabitants are not said to be renunciants of the material world, but rather enjoy all pleasures that we do, and use them as a means of liberation. This non-dual, unified attitude towards the physical is curious especially when we think of the various spiritual and religious practices of these outer lands, many of which deem the material world as corrupt or something one must distance themselves from, as is promoted in Gnosticism, Christianity, and Buddhism. It's said that the inhabitants of Shambhala possess all sorts of extraordinary psychic powers, such as the ability to read others' thoughts, to foresee the future, and walk at very high speeds. They also have the ability to become invisible. It's an intermediary state between samsara and nirvana, samsara being the state everyone who is watching this is in, the cycle of reincarnation, and nirvana being the liberation from this cycle of rebirth and death. 
Shambhala is therefore considered to be the best place to achieve enlightenment and spiritual wisdom, the final earthly point before liberation. As pure of a place this is, some sources say the people of Shambhala are not fully enlightened. They still retain some human failings and illusions, but fewer than people of these outer lands. Enlightenment, however, is the goal, and it's the highest attainment for those in Shambhala. Various mythological paradises have been associated at one point or another with the North Pole. Interestingly, the Hebrew term for the North alludes to a mystical location, a hidden or secret place. Tzaphon means North, and this comes from the root Tzaphan, which means a hidden, treasured, or secret place. The specific layout of this region is unknown. But we do know there are four island continents. The Mahabharata describes one of these island continents, stating that it is the residence of the Siddhas, the enlightened sages. The trees there bear sweet fruits and flowers. Some of the trees yield fruits according to the will of the plucker. The people of that country are free from illness and are always cheerful. Ten thousand and ten hundred years they live, and never abandon one another. For practitioners of the Tibetan Bon tradition, Shambhala is called Tagzik Olmo Lung Ring. Its description is very similar to that of Shambhala, being a realm where peace and joy abounds. The only difference from Shambhala is that instead of Mount Maru being in the center, it is a sacred mountain called Yung Drung Gutsek, where four rivers flow from. Tagzik Olmo Lung Ring is said not to be accessible to humans in the state of dualism. In order to enter, one must diligently purify the body and mind. Bon monks consider it a great honor and spiritual achievement to be reborn in Olmo Lung Ring. William Warren, the author of Paradise Found, knew of this divine location, and I urge anybody who would like a more specific review to check out that book. From it, I quote, Whoever seeks as a probable location for paradise the heavenliest spot on earth, with respect to light and darkness, and with respect to celestial scenery, must be content to seek it at the Arctic Pole. Here is the true city of the sun. Here is the one and only spot on earth, respecting which it would seem as if the Creator had said, as of his own heavenly residence, there shall be no night there. Jambadvipa is a land of pureness, what Richard Levitin has written as being luminously bright with purified consciousness, where land and mind are inseparable. The residents, quasi or post-humans, are similarly effulgent with light, and their bodies seem more of light than matter, opulently decorated in bangles, earrings, rings, necklaces, crowns, and other light-based adornments. Pure thoughts are the landscape, Spiritual beings are the terrain's features, and the inside and outside are not different, mind and land, consciousness and projected world. Perched high above this land is said to be a gigantic jambu tree, also known as the rose apple tree. This tree is native here to India and Southeast Asia. Jambadvipa gets its name from this tree, literally referring to the land of the jambu trees where Jambu is the name of the species, and Vipa means island or continent. Mount Maru is the axis, the heavenly pillar at the center of the four continent system, and surrounding Maru is four great mountains with four giant trees. So the tree overlooking Jambu Vipa is the Jambu tree, standing on top of what's called Mount Himavat. The Jambu fruits from this tree are supposedly the size of elephants, and when ripe, fall and break open, flowing juice into a river known as Jambu Nadi. The inhabitants drink this juice and because of it are said to experience optimum health and longevity. It's said that there is a transmutation which occurs when the sun, which we know to be the black sun, and the air react with the juice, creating gold which is used for ornaments of the demigods who live in this land. Jambadvipa is the region where the humans live and is said to be the only place where a being may become enlightened by being born as a human being. This has been falsely translated, though, as meaning Earth is Jambadvipa. Most mainstream Buddhist cosmologists will tell you that we're in Jambadvipa right now, 
But the reason it's said that this land is the land of the humans is because it's the area which humans typically come from the outer world. It is in Jambadvipa that one may receive the gift of Dharma and come to understand the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism, and ultimately realize the liberation from the cycle of life and death, called Moksha. So the inhabitants of Jambadvipa are particularly aware of the workings of karma, since the goal in this land is to achieve freedom from the material and ascend upwards into the spiritual. The Diamond Throne is directly in the middle of Jambadvipa. It is here that a Bodhisattva, meaning someone who has achieved Nirvana, sits in perfect union with the All. The inhabitants of Jambadvipa, as well as Purva Vidha and Aparagodaniya, two of the other island continents, are said to possess eight organs. It's becoming clear that we live in a geometrically divided realm, where each part of the realm contains different densities. The same way the Antarctic ice wall is the protective mechanism for what we know as Flat Earth, there is a spiritual filter as well as a physical barrier, another ice wall, surrounding the center land. for watching i hope you enjoyed this video presentation if you did please subscribe to my youtube channel like the video and share it on your favorite social media sites there's a lot more to come so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time